In 2007, the world spent in excess of $25 billion on wristwatches. That's nearly $4 for everyone on the planet. In this film, I endeavor to find out what it is that makes watches so special. I will take a look at some of the most exceptional and desirable watches known to man. I'll meet some of the curious people who buy them and try to understand the powerful infatuation with these tiny little machines we like to tie to our wrists. Hi, it's Tom. Look at that, eh? Hey? Watch doing, doctor. Man. You are the watch guru. My guide and companion on this journey, Tom Bolt, is Europe's preeminent dealer and vintage watch expert. His client list is a who's who of the rich and famous. A small selection of who we will meet in this film. Actors, for example, like Trevor Eve. Watch dealer? Yeah. And, and customer. <laughs> <laughs> Drinking from the appropriate <laughs> Actresses, like our own priceless national but, treasure. Do you know I've worn really cool. all my life? I've worn men's watches, you know that, don't you? I think I started the craze. Landowning aristocrats like Henry Dent Brocklehurst. You are a heathen on certain things, Tom, I have to say. Like, you're not a food head at all. I love my food. You are, you like to go to Tootsie's and have a burger. What the f are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> and premiership footballers, such as Jamie Redknapp, Frank Lampard, and Rio Ferdinand. Rio, how you doing? Listen, OK, listen, I'll meet you in, if you go down Bond Street, I'll meet you in DKNY. The rather conservative watch industry itself turns to Tom Bolt on many occasions to invent patents, authenticate collections, provide opinion, and write articles all over the world. His alias is no coincidence or wishful thinking. He really is the watch guru. Facts are, Rolex made the first automatic waterproof watch in history. Abraham Louis Breguet invented the tourbillon, and he made the first perpetual calendar of all time. Everybody else, in my opinion, is sort of scratching around to get a piece of their history. My journey begins in a bank vault, as Tom Reddy's two rare vintage Daytonas for one of his oldest clients, John Bardiger, a bona fide, nailed-on watchaholic. So is this a potential watch for your client today? This is, yes. John Bardiger is after a particularly rare Rolex Daytona, known as the Peruvian especially made in the 1970s for the Peruvian Air Force. This is a watch that, let's say, in 1988, roughly the last price of it was probably, let's say, 700, 800 quid, and today they're from 20 grand up to 50, 60, 70. They arranged to meet at John's girlfriend's flat later that day. And I'll see you at K's in half an hour. I've got the I've got the Peruvian on me. Fine. Jonathan, do your hair. I'm no stranger to the odd watch purchase myself. This film is an opportunity to jack in my modest watch collection and have the watch guru help me find the one perfect watch for me. If I were to take my watches to the next level, yeah, you see, where would I go? Where would you think I should go? Because I don't need all my watches. I'm just thinking, you know what? It'd be good just to get... Consolidate? Yeah. Yeah. Into but one. then what'll happen is you'll consolidate and you'll think, mm, you know what? I love my one watch, I truly love it, but it would be nice just to have one to wear to the beach and one to, you know. Well, I'm hoping that the one watch will be okay for any particular any event. Any given Sunday? Yeah. Okay. Well, what's your luck on that? It's obvious to me that Tom and John go back a long way. Without delay, they get straight down to business. Oh dear. That's about 73, 74. And what movement? The pushers haven't got the recess. They're like, they're like block tree trunk pushers. They're fatter, chunkier pushers. Unusual. Than you see, very. Then, like any salesman worth their salt, the golden surprise. A vintage gold Daytona. The perfect oh, companion. Yeah. The yellow gold 6265. Stunning. It's a nice piece. The pair of Daytonas on John's wrist are worth over £70,000. A great deal more, I suspect, than my watches. What's my budget, anyway, would you say? I have a now-deleted Rolex Steel Zenith Movement Daytona, a Rolex Submariner, a Bulgari Ergon Chronograph, and a Bell & Ross Pilot's Watch, giving me a total, I hope, of around £12,000. Between eight and 9000 quid. The Rolexes have held their value, but the other two, they've tanked spectacularly. A watch is a device with which to tell the time, of course, but I have my doubts that that's what we buy it for. I don't think a watch is about telling the time. The time is everywhere, in the streets, on our mobile phones, 
kitchen cookers, computers. I always feel, <laughs> what is a watch for? For wearing? <laughs> I need to get a handle on what watches really mean to us. So I start at the top, at the most exclusive watch store in the country, Marcus of Bond Street. Tom introduces me to the man himself, Marcus Margotis. James doesn't actually think that you look at the time. James doesn't believe that he actually looks at his watch for the Hold time. Hold on, he's, he's absolutely correct, because you can tell the time <laughs> in a dozen ways today. It's a beautifully made thing that feels good, and the fact that it's also doing something, it's not a piece of jewellery as such. Just next door to Marcus, Tom takes me to meet an old colleague of his, Arno Bombager, the managing director of Cartier UK, the jewel in the Richemont Roots crowd. Whether you like it or not, it's a piece of jewellery. That you start. Cartier, I guess. Cartier, I do come back to. Yeah. A universe away from the hustle and bustle of London's West End, tucked away in a picturesque fold in the quiet Gloucestershire countryside, the castle at the centre of the thousand-year-old, 1,400-acre Sudley estate is home to Henry Dent Brocklehurst. This is the ultimate Rolex. And, and it's GMT, an isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. It's called the, the, the Patriot. Patriot, obviously, because the red, white, and blue bezel. I mean, if you wanted to go gold and sophisticated, you'd go with that, right? Or maybe even, or maybe even. Or maybe even this. Yeah. Maybe even this. Yeah. For sh okay. If you wanted to walk around scratching your nuts, <laughs> you'd go for this. The <laughs> <laughs> watch is one of the very few ways that a man can express his personality. You know, if I put a white gold for 10,000 on my wrist, the platinum is 15, to the naked eye they look the same. What would you prefer? The platinum. Because I know it's platinum. I know it's platinum, and I'm not doing it for somebody else, though, but I know. It seems to me, where someone's car may be either turbo, petrol, diesel, or even electric, so too the innards of a watch, be they manual, automatic, or, dare I utter such profanity in this program, quartz. Basically, there are three core movements. You've got quartz, which involves a battery, and is perhaps the cheapest variant of the three movements. And it has a second hand that ticks. If you want a watch, and you want to bring it down to really ABC, go and buy a seconda for 15 quid. I mean, that's very easy. It's got a, a Japanese quartz movement that is fantastic quality. Just a stone's throw from Marcus, across Piccadilly, are the offices of Girard Perigord, one of the oldest, most exclusive Swiss watch manufacturers still in existence. Their UK managing director, Leonard Thompson and Tom, go way back when, to a time when they were both cutting their teeth in the 1980s watch business. When I used to work in retail, and I used to sell expensive ladies' watches that had a quartz movement that were bought by their husbands. The husbands could never justify the price because it had a quartz mm, movement. Sure. So they would buy the mechanical version if they could. I guarantee you, a few weeks later, the watch would come back and it would be exchanged for the quartz version because to put the watch down and then have to reset it, start it and everything, it really wasn't in their kind of um, level. And you tell them a watch that works, we needed to have some quartz movement, some, some special quartz movement. And there's nothing against quartz, I mean, as far as I'm concerned. We uh, wanted to ensure that the watch would work perfectly well. And we had, you know, a big chunk, a big, big uh, segment for ourselves with uh, quartz watches. I get the impression that for most men, and certainly the watch collector, quartz is a no-no. It would be like driving a Prius or Sinclair C5 instead of a Porsche. A watch has to have an engine. Manual movements basically are mechanical, but you literally wind the winder in order to get the power up in the mainspring. It's a mechanical piece of jewellery for a man. I've tried to analyse the kind of men that like watches and cars, and I have to say that although I am one of them, I'm not a huge fan of the men that do. I'm not sure that they're the kind of best people on the planet. Automatic watches are, in effect, again, just mechanical movements. They have a disc, which is called a rotor in the back, and upon the movement of your wrist, this disc floats around and winds this wheel. Mechanical movements, be them automatic or manual, they have a second hand that sort of glides more. I'm learning that a watch is as special as a car, an automated coat of arms, yet head to head, when push comes to shove, it seems that the watch is that little bit more special. This is the price of a, uh, <coughs> a 
of a BMW convertible. Mind you, I'd rather have that than a BMW. I'd rather drive a diesel people carrier for the rest of my life and continue to collect watches. But a watch, you know, you take off, put it in drawer. I mean, I came home with three and that. Three watches, travel, but moved, you know. <laughs> For me, it's just so user-friendly. You can travel with it, you can go anywhere in the world with them, you can send them around. But then, for everyone that loves a watch, there are the guys that think, well, I can tell the time on my mobile phone or on the kitchen uh, cooker, whatever. Uh, why do I need a watch, you know? We don't like them, so, do we, Lenny? We don't like those people. Not at all, no. I've got no they time for no place for them. in today's society. Coming up next, I discover the euphoric qualities of watch collecting, delve into the murky world of fake watches, Take Tom on a unique journey to meet the ultimate living watchman. With my own budget in mind, it's time to start looking for this new watch. I've been having a look at your website over mm -hmm. the weekend and really quite like the look of the gold Daytona with the diamond face. I feel like the boss man. Do you? Yeah, there you go. Yeah. You like that, don't you? I do, I... but I'm also thinking, you know, I've always been on Rolex. I've got to tell you. Yeah. I'll stick with Patek and Rolex. Yeah. I can't go wrong. I mean, you can actually take your Rolex into any country, anywhere in the world. You can go to a jeweler, you can say, you know what, you can buy it from me, and you're going to get to within, as long as he's not a rogue, to within 10 to 15% of every dealer all over the world. The next question to consider is whether I'm better off buying new or second hand. What I will advise is which watch is likely to go down more or go up more. And as a general uh, principle, yes, you've got far more of a chance in old watches if you're buying for investment as new watches. There's merit to you still getting maybe a new car with extended warranties and anything like that. With a watch, as long as it's authentic, actually, what can go wrong with it? The worst that can happen is it's gonna cost a couple hundred quid to have it cleaned and fixed. Your watch is worth what you can go out and sell it for isn't it? And half the time, retailers who have agencies of different brands are buying their wholesale stock at actually slightly more than it's worth to cash out. So they're constantly kind of chasing their tails. It's a very difficult business to be in, you know? What I seem to be finding out is that buying some brand new watches can lead to a pretty quick depreciation of up to 70%. If your infatuation justifies it, fine. But for me, I think I'm better off investment-wise sticking to the pre-owned market. Ultimately, I would say someone should collect watches because they love them, they dig them, and they're, you know, they're into them. And if there's an upside, fantastic. Ten years ago, you wouldn't get 1,500 quid for this watch. Right now, it's 20,000 quid. Like the Rolex Orange Hand Explorer, this 1960s pre-moon landing Omega Speedmaster is now worth 4,000 pounds. Ten years ago, you'd have been lucky to get 400 pounds from it. Some watches can do remarkably well, yes. But by and large, the message I'm getting that if you are sensible, you should be looking at worst at coming out even on your watch, or at best watching it grow by about 50% annually. Yes, there is an investment side to the business, of course there is, and I mean no offence to you about this, Henry, but if there is some kind of sleeper watch that I buy for 20 grand, that I know that in 10 years is going to be worth half a million quid, I'm probably going to plank it myself. Now, that all seems fairly straightforward, but of course it isn't. Watches are a drug. A potent addiction that's hard to master. People who get to, say, the level of uh, being able to purchase into ultra luxury, let's take Patek as the example, the, the, the chances are they probably won't buy one. They do get bitten by the bug and then it becomes a, a kind of habitual process. It's like favourite anything, unfortunately, otherwise I wouldn't be here today. <laughs> I've always liked watches, I mean, it's a bit of a disease. John has returned with a deal in mind. He wants the Peruvian for sure but he's also brought in his entire watch collection to see if he can snag the golden surprise as well as part of an equitable horse trade. So this is what he's going for? Yeah. Man, he's really had a sort of bling meltdown, hasn't it? John's it's watch downsizing no, 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 to, to get out of to a this recent watch. spell in rehab. They said in rehab. Oh. I went, they said, how do you feel? And I went, woo! I went, there's a hole. I think he spent some time in Arizona. And they didn't quite get it. <laughs> <laughs> the woman said to me, and I left, she said, John, when you leave, she says, it's great to have you, but calm it down, not too much. A rehab alumni himself 
Henry understands all too well the legacy of Watchaholism. <laughs> he got confronted and part of his, <laughs> part of his amends was to, to dump the blick and get real. Get real, get honest, and dump the blame. I've got to go to therapy because I've got to get... <laughs> <laughs> You don't go nearly enough in that. No, I don't. And I'm going to take these to, sh to, to show my analyst. Back at the swap shop, John and Tom are really struggling to find common ground. No, because I can't do it. Why? I don't have my head set in it, and I don't want to go away and say I shouldn't have done that because it's not that, it's not the be-all end. I want to be happy by it. But there's so many ponderals about it, I don't like to be it because I quite like the gold. The following day, I have to confess to Tom that the modern Rolex Daytona I've been test driving isn't really working for him. He explains why that is. I think watches are about people, and I think that you are an interesting character in that you are quite old school. I guess, yeah. I think, but with a very funky edge to you. Based on this assessment of me, Tom selects a very rare vintage gold Rolex Submariner, which he believes is the most neat. A little over budget, but I like it. Let's put it and Tom's theory to the test. And there's only one test that counts. Girls. These aren't necessarily the watches that you like the best. Mm -hmm. They're the watches you think that look the coolest on him. Right. I like, I like that one. I would say this one. This one and this one. I think that one. I think definitely that one. Yes, yeah, so I do. With this outer black face, or the outer black rim and uh, the black face, it's a little edgy. So far, okay, we are six of six on the gold submarine. Yeah, everybody said the gold sub. I'm impressed. It seems as if the guru does actually know what he's talking about, that there is some sort of symbiosis between the watch and its owner. A cool watch on you may not be such a cool watch on me. Hey, I've got a little bit of bad news. What's that? Le Mans. Yeah? We're going by train. Oh, you've got to be kidding me, man. No way. Yeah. Yes way. Having been guided so well by Tom so far, it's my turn to take him on a journey to meet his very own watch crew. We are uh, bombing towards Richard Meal. Richard Meal launched his revolutionary watches in 1999. He applied his background in Formula One racing to the architecture, raw materials, and design concepts of his unique watches. And that's why we're heading to the Le Mans Classic in France, a racing event devoted to the finest vintage sports cars of all time. And unsurprisingly, sponsored by Richard Mille himself. He is the only person for me that um, kind of excites me as far as modern watchmaking. I'm really quite, I think it's quite cool again. So this one is, yeah. what, about 250? No, 220. And that's about, 450, did you say? Yeah. Okay. And then this one? They just got up. I believe they're now around 1065, 1070. So basically, that's a meal. <laughs> yeah, I guess you could say that's a proper Ricky meal. As we hurtle through the French countryside, I try to understand why it is that Rolex is such a powerful brand and why, for most of us, it is the go to world. You asked before how I got into watching, and that was from my dad taking me to see Live and Let Die when I was uh, seven or something. And in that, there's this scene with Roger Moore where he frees himself and Jane Seymour from the shark tank with a sort of rotating buzzsaw bezel on his submarine. I remember, yeah. remember that? That's the thing that sort of impregnated my mind with when you're a man, you have a Rolex. That's the hold that Rolex has that for many, many people, it's still an aspirational purchase for them. You know, when they buy their Rolex, it's like they've achieved something. No wonder the others have to go to ever more extraordinary advertising needs to compete. This appeal with kind of extreme sports at the moment, you know, it's kind of a phase, I think, you know. And so uh, a lot of the brands are kind of following that because then for some of the people buying into that product, they're buying into that dream. Yeah, well, Jose Marino was doing his um, press conference for Inter Milan, and I noticed he had a Richard Meal on. I mean, I hope it doesn't make me sound shallow, but I just, just noticed it, you know, because they, <laughs> yeah. they, they, they do stand out as a watch. They do, absolutely. The dude that goes out and buys La Jolla thinking Brad, what's... what's he's, gonna, how, he's gonna play the mating game better. But... That's what he thinks. But it hasn't, doesn't come Maybe with a mask. Be... Of Brian, <laughs> <laughs> does it? Well, it comes really in a does. little box and you strap it to your wrist. Ah, this is a man that wears a Cartier watch. So if he wears a Cartier watch, that means he's a man of taste. He's a man of power because it's maybe more expensive than the other one. And that's what, you know, you buy. I think you could write Cartier on a banana. 
and put it on a wrist. And you know what? I think it would sell because I think the name is that powerful. The reason maybe why the name of Cartier is so powerful is that uh, we didn't do it. We didn't put our name on the banana. We arrive at Le Mans for the first time. Tony's not looking quite so I am quite nervous about interviewing you, shouldn't I? Thank you for, um, basically for renewing my passion within modern watches. The bottom line is, watches are fundamentally a man thing, and their relationship to cars simply won't go away. Philippe Massa is racing with my watches. He's, uh, and some, from the, he even raced two years, two seasons, with a tourbillon watch, and everybody told me I was cuckoo. Richard Mille's watches are quite literally built using the same principles as a Formula One racing car. My tourbillon, you can see, the bridges are like a suspension. And boom, boom, boom. And, and they resist to a lot of huge shocks. For me, the most obvious similarity that there is between cars and watches are with the Porsche 911 and the Rolex Oyster. If you take them decade by decade, you can literally see the slow, slow transformation, but always sticking to the core soul of the actual design. You got the 60s, kind of late 60s, orange hand explorer with the kind of funky colors, just kind of pimping it out a little bit more than the 50s stuff, you know? And now that we're in the 70s, it's much more bulldog, squat, here I am, baby. That's yeah. what the 70s is all about. Absolutely. And the equivalent as far as a Rolex, gold Submariner, gold Day Day, and it's like, you know what, if you got it, flaunt it. This for me, you know, the eight for me is the ultimate modern yes, watch. Yes, really? Yes. Congratulations. Yes. yes. When you think that to just a second. Can I keep it a bit longer? <laughs> Here's what I'm thinking at this stage. Why not get a fake watch for a fraction of the cost and none of the sartorial headache? Basically, Jack, there are four types of fakes. Really. You've got the really cheap market stuff for kind of, you know, fiver or whatever. Mm -hmm. You've then got the stuff that's like 40, 50 quid that you can buy in kind of Hong Kong and stuff. Then you've got stuff that people really try to fool people with. And then you get the adaptations. So in other words, someone might take a Rolex 1950s Overtone, as it's known, and they would convert it into a Rolex Oyster moon phase. It can be a confusing business telling the difference between high-end fakes and genuine watches, as Henry Dent Brocklehurst found out firsthand when the rarest Rolex Daytona in the world, commissioned by the Sultan of Oman, stretched the credulity of one major watch dealer. You see this watch here? OK, here we go. Which I have owned at one point. Um, the pride and joy of the, that is the top of the Christmas tree. Um, walk into a watch shop in Miami, and the biggest watch dealer in Miami says, <laughs> That's a fake. I call Tom from the airport and I say, well, this is Bugging out. I mean, freaking out. Bugging At Miami airport. This is a situation where when I arrived in Miami, everybody I was staying with was, oh my God, that is the coolest watch I've ever seen. Wow. By the end of my stay in Miami, I was the laughing stock of, Kate, of Coral Gables. <laughs> So the guy says, I'll put my whole reputation on the fact that that is, that's, that's a hodgepodge from Texas. It's a chop shop. And I'm like, well, Tom, have you got any paperwork for this watch? I trust you. And he really. wouldn't back down, really, because he even sent you upstairs to his watchmaker. Yeah. And his watchmaker took it apart and said, fine. Right? Yep. The reality is that we got all the paperwork finally back, proved him completely wrong. He just looked very humbled and sorry for himself. It is estimated that replica watches cost the Swiss watch industry, something in the region of $1.6 billion a year. But however perfect the replica, it's still a lie, and a lie that the real watch enthusiasts can't quite swallow. Could you tolerate a really top quality fake watch, for example? No. I'm far too shallow to be OK with wearing a kind of fake watch. I would have to know that I'm wearing the real thing. I can't quite decide whether wearing a fake watch takes courage or not, but I still want to find out how easy it is to find an affordable and convincing replica of a luxury watch. This came from China, which is a fake Nautilus Jumbo Patek Philippe. When we met with Mark Hearn, the managing director of Patek Philippe UK, he was adamant that his brand was the least affected, if at all by the fake market. So, you know, outside Harrods, often, sometimes, you know, when I'm in Knightsbridge, you see these street sellers offering fake this, fake that. Mm -hmm. You don't see them offering a fake Patek Philippe. And uh, I shan't mention any names, but I've seen dealers that have bought um, a, a 3800, a stainless yeah. steel Patek yeah. Philippe Nautilus, um, as the, the right thing. And these people yeah. have got no watches. Well, there is the beast. It looks OK. 
I'm quite impressed. I need to show this to Tom. Let me get his expert opinion. This basically, for me, kind of just smashes the mirrors and blows the smoke away. The point is, it's actually about technological advances being such today that it is becoming harder and harder for the high-end watch manufacturers to justify the astronomical prices they charge. And how much is it? $300. Making this watch as a waterproof watch as well, in, in the correct way that the original was manufactured, for the price they have, says to me, the watchmakers on the whole today, I think they take the One truly great thing about Pate, their record keeping of every single watch manufactured. Anybody who, uh, who buys a Patek Philippe can check with the archives in uh, Geneva. They can go onto the website yeah. and, and do an archive search and they can find out whether or not uh, the watch is genuine or whether or not it, uh, it isn't. Yet, the war on fake watches is an enormous undertaking. There's an army of lawyers, of, uh, of people, investigators, and, and going traveling the world to try to catch all these people. Another week has gone by and John returns with his straight-talking girlfriend to settle the golden surprise issue once and for all. It's either worth it to you to pay an extra whatever for that, or it isn't. And if it isn't, fine, walk away. This has been going on for two weeks. No, but you've got all, we've all got all the watches. You're all right now. For two weeks here, John. Come yeah. on. I don't know the number. Put five minutes on the car. What's the number? I feel my own journey has reached its end. I've found no reason to doubt Tom's advice. Tell me, Guru. Now I need you to tell me what you think. I'm sticking with my gold sub because it's basically unbeatable. I love these and I, I, think, I think these are very undervalued. And I've seen one with a, after a couple a of weeks of wear, I feel okay, convinced, they do, they do for the time being at least, that this is the watch for me. I'll make you a bet now, all right, a gentleman's yes, bet, no. that within six months, yeah. okay, you want me to find you a yellow gold vintage 6265 Daytona and you'll pay me 40,000 quid for one. Do you want the bet? No. Do you agree with me, okay? Do you want the bet? Uh, you'll never win it, you know why? You out know of pride, you wouldn't do it. No, you out, know what? Out, out of pride, you wouldn't do it. Do you know it. what? So stubbornly cut his leg off. You know what? what? Forget the six months, could be tomorrow. <laughs>